behalf of Namitha Kokhle and William Dalrymple and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome you back to JLF's Brave New World. The series was born out of the need to ensure a free flow of knowledge and information, even as countries and city states and gated communities lock down upon themselves. Over 100 episodes and 3 million views later, we've been able to feature Nobel laureates, Oran Pamuk, Esther Duflo, Abhijit Banerjee, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, Booker Pulitzer, Commonwealth Award-winning authors, including Margaret Atwood, Peter Carey, Howard Jacobson, George Saunders, Shumpa Lahiri, Dr. Siddharth Mukherjee, Shashi Tharoor, Edmund de Waal, and so many others. All our sessions are available to view on our Facebook page, JLF LitFest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur LitFest JLF. Our session today is Red Carpets and Other Banana Skins. Rupert Everett in conversation with Sandeep Roy. An element of drama has always attended Rupert Everett, even before he swept to fame with his outstanding performance in another country. He has spent his life surrounded by extraordinary people and witnessed extraordinary events. He was in Moscow during the fall of communism, in Berlin the night the wall came down, and in downtown Manhattan on September the 11th. By the age of 17, he was friends with Andy Warhol and Bianca Jagger, and since then, he's been up close and personal with some of the most famous women in the world, including Julia Roberts, Madonna, Sharon Stone, and Donatella Versace. A superb raconteur and a keen observer of human folly, especially his own, Everett turns his life into a captivating story of love, fame, glamour, gossip, and drama. Rupert Everett first appeared on stage in 1981 as Guy Bennett in the Western production of Julian Mitchell's play, Another Country, a role which he repeated in the 1984 film version, which saw him nominated for a BAFTA as Best Newcomer. Subsequent nominations include a BAFTA and Golden Globe for My Best Friend's Wedding. Sandeep Roy is a writer, journalist, and broadcaster based in Kolkata. He's the host of the Sandeep Roy Show on Audio Express and a columnist for Mint Lounge and The Hindu. His novel, Don't Let Him Know, is now out in paperback. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it into the comment section below. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. Ladies and gentlemen, red carpets and other banana skins. Rupert Everett in conversation with Sandeep Roy. Thank you so much, Sanjoy and uh, Rupert, Rupert Everett. Welcome to this brave new world. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, I'm not a Zoom expert, so you must forgive me if anything goes wrong. Um, none of us are. We live in an age of Zoom anxiety. It's okay. It's true. <laughs> but didn't you, do a play, didn't you recently do a play on Zoom? I did. Um, th there was a play that had been uh, in London uh, um, last year, and it was uh, it was about to transfer into a West End theatre. And then uh, the pandemic began, and uh, so all their plans were scuppered. And they wanted to do a Zoom version of it. So uh, I was uh, approached to take part, which was great. It was a wonderful play called Rush. But it was very, very, very nerve wracking because. Uh, Actually, between you and me, it's, it, t t two people talking is okay. But when you're trying to do a play where ideally people talk over each other and there's some kind of interaction between all the characters, there's something rather like a kind of weird dream. It's like, you know those dreams you sometimes have where you're not quite getting somewhere and you're not... It's, it, it was very... It made me feel it was very anxiety making and uh, it went quite well. But um, I think we all felt very nervous by the end. Well, well you, you've written in your memoir that, you know, the noise of the audience entering a theatre on the first night of production, that's a high, more than an orgasm or a drug. And you said the closest you could compare it to was and waiting for your HIV test results to come out. I mean, right. what, does, what happens with that when you're performing on Zoom? Well, I think that's it. You've really put, pinpointed the problem. Uh, there's, uh, you know, all these jobs that to do with communication and to do with audience. And uh, I, I don't know whether audiences realize this, but in the theater, they're an integral part 
of the performance. And they can change the performance, by the way, every day into something different. And uh, suddenly when they disappeared, uh, there's a very flat feeling. Uh, and, uh, and it's not even, you know, even when you make movies or television, you still have an audience. Everyone quietens down before a take and there's a feeling of concentration and everybody's concentrated on the action. And I think that's the concentration on the action is part of the magic of, of performance, really, of other people. Right. You know, I, I have to say that um, right off the bat that I don't think I've ever, well, I definitely have never had the opportunity and I doubt I will ever have the opportunity again to be talking to someone and have a line in his book that goes, okay, so I'm not having an affair with Rudolf Nureyev, I said, but I am shagging Ian McKellen, I swear. I mean, and this is not fiction. It's part of a memoir. <laughs> what did you, when did you feel that it was safe to write a memoir and be as candid as that? Because it requires a certain kind of ruthlessness to tell the truth. Well, it's uh, for me. It didn't. Um, it didn't seem to be an issue. I, I made friends with this boy uh, when we were. Uh, he came to audition at my drama school, and then we we were both dressers uh, in in the theatre, dressing the actors uh, in the Royal Shakespeare Company. And uh, you know, I was a fantasist, and I loved Rudolf Nureyev. And I used to go and hang out uh, at the stage door uh, when Rudolf Nureyev was performing, really at the, at the end of his kind of career, really. This must have been 1978. And um, I'd pretend to Joe, this friend of mine, oh, I'm, I'm actually going to go meet Rudolf. And uh, he was so young and green, he kind of believed it. And I would just go off and then hang out by the stage door of the theatre. And then one day he happened to be going past the stage door of the theater and saw me hanging out there and um and so that's how that story happened and um it was just uh, i don't know it's a funny story when you're writing a book you try want to entertain people and uh i think um i think it's more interesting and uh to be to try to try and strip down the artifact and be as honest as you can if you can yeah, if you can. I mean, and, you know, um, people living or dead can be harmed by what you one writes. Well. But yeah, and so you, you know, you do know when to draw the line, you know, and, and all of that. But for example, in this case, the Ian McKellen part, did uh, you have to finish the rest of the story about how you met Sir Ian McKellen? Uh, did I? Um, I well, well I, I was a terrible stage door Johnny. Uh, uh, when I was uh, starting out in the theatre, I would be, I would go to the stage doors and, and wait for people. And that's how I, um, I met him too. And, um, but I think uh, a lot of people were like that in those days. I, I've met many people who spent, uh, of my age, who kind of spent their, their youth uh, hanging around stage doors and, and stuff like that. And it was in, in tremendously evocative and exciting. And you, it was the closest... When, when you're not in show business, uh, in, it, it looks like a world, it is a world actually, it's almost impossible to get into. Uh, uh, and uh, the stage door is sometimes is the closest you can get. You can just see the dark interior of a theatre through, through a stage door and that's quite often as close as you ever get. And um, so it was, uh, it was exciting and, uh, and I met tons of people actually, tons of actors uh, waiting at the stage door. Did Ian McKellen ever knew, know that uh, you were uh, boasting about Rudolf Nureyev instead? I have no idea. <laughs> but when did you start thinking, you know, you started about being an actor. When did you start taking writing seriously? Um, I started taking writing seriously uh, quite early on, actually, um, but um, not very successfully. I, I wrote a couple of novels when I was in my 20s. Uh, and, uh, and then I stopped and really, I suppose when I was about, uh, 45, 44, I started again, really because, uh, work had kind of dried up for me and, uh, I, and I, I needed to try and refocus and, um, more and more since then I found, uh, writing is, is, uh, is, uh, 
been 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 a wonderful thing for me particularly now because uh, it looks to in in our country at any rate and i think in most places in the world we don't really we haven't figured out a way really of going back to work uh, certainly not in the theater really and uh, pretty much not in the in in tv and in cinema so suddenly writing becomes like uh, the most wonderful thing to be able to do because you can you can stay on your own and um so I'm, I'm concentrating, I'm doing a lot of writing at the moment. And does criticism for, by the way, I should say like years ago when I lived in San Francisco, um, I went into this bookstore in the Castro and your, I guess that was your first novel, uh, Hello right. Darling. In my, right. I, I remember seeing that and I picked it up and, and read it in one sort of big gasp <laughs> and a gush. So it's it's quite exciting to know <laughs> Zoom talking to you after all those years. But well, does criticism for your writing versus films affect you differently? No, I think uh, criticism is a really tough thing uh, to to deal with. Um, I mean, um, I think. Uh, it can be very, very demoralizing. Uh, at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm not against criticism. I just find, uh, uh, I think it's difficult. It's always difficult to cope with. You know, everybody wants to uh, be enjoyed. And uh, when, when people don't enjoy you, it takes a long time to kind of really figure out how that happens. I mean, not how, yet, that happens, how to deal with it, really. Right. But, I mean, one of the things that, as somebody just who doesn't know you, but is getting, you know, thinks he has an idea of you by reading your memoir. It seems like um, it's often that you wear your wear failure as lightly as you wear success. So sometimes, you know, you're in a film and you're not, it feels like you, you say, I know I was, I mean, it's quite amazing the number of roles you talk about where including and quiet flows the dawn where you say, I was, hopelessly ill-suited for that part. Well, um, I think but that's another, this is another failure. Once you've, once you've acclimatized yourself to the criticism, and by the way, you can be criticized and still have a success, but failure itself, I think, is uh, very nourishing. Uh, it always, uh, up, up until a certain age, maybe. I mean, after a certain age, now when I fail, I think, oh, can I be bothered uh, to try and clamber back up? Uh, but when you're younger, it really, uh, I think it's very motivating. And um, I have found every time I've crashed, it's really pulled something out of me. Uh, for example, starting to write uh, when I was about 44 again, it was because I'd kind of come to a, to a dead end. And, I, uh, and something inside me really pulled something out. So in that sense, I think uh, failure is great. It's also, uh, once you've got over the sting of it, uh, the sting of the criticism, and that's why uh, then then it's uh, then it becomes funny as well, because um, uh, because it's only it's it's only failure and uh, it's only success, and both of them actually uh, uh, success is harder to deal with than failure. Failure the only way is up, success the only way is down. So um, uh, it's um, in one sense it's better to be on the bargain basement floor working your way up to first floor fashion. Uh, rather than being being you know in the penthouse, about to fall right off the roof down onto the uh, onto the pavement, I think. Well, that is true, and it's uh, they, I was struck also reading the books books that how many times you you describe a scene and said I had no idea at that time, but this was about as good as this was going to get. You know, this was <laughs> going to be the the best thing. But when you talk about learning from failure. You, there's a part where you talk about you suddenly get a call from the one and only Orson Welles himself from Hollywood and you are excited, starstruck, and you rush to Hollywood to meet him. This is an old aging Orson Welles. The first meeting Orson Welles' dog is bites you in the leg mm -hmm. while you're trying to have lunch with him. And that project goes nowhere. What, what do you, when you say you learn from failure, what did you learn from that experience? Well, that was actually, that was really, that period was my biggest, biggest failure because um, I think uh, I realized something in, in that encounter. Uh, I was tremendously disappointing to Orson Welles. I could just see it as soon as he saw me because he'd seen me in a film, uh, Another Country, uh, and that film, I kind of owned that film in one sense. I, I'd been in a play of, of, um, of, 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 the, of the story. I'd been part of transferring that 
original play into the West End. My friend had done it, and my friend produced it as a film. I was the center of the film. And I had a kind of, uh, I, I lost all that. When I got to America to be with Orson Welles, I suddenly saw myself through his eyes. And uh, I just wasn't in a kind of boys' clubbishness uh, kind of frame of mind enough. I was, uh, I was quite taut and anxious. You know, this was 1983, I think. So AIDS had just begun. Uh, I had had a, uh, you know, fairly, you know, large uh, sex life. Uh, I didn't know whether maybe I'd, can, uh, I'd, I'd got HIV or not. I was already in front of the camera. It was very, looking back, again, I didn't really realize this at the time, but looking back, I do now see that I was incredibly uptight. Uh, I thought at any minute I might get that disease. Uh, and so um, I don't think I was capable of being what you really need to be as a young actor arriving in Hollywood to charm uh, a cantankerous old star. I was a, I was a kind of coiled, complicated, uh, all fingers and thumbs. I couldn't open my mouth. All my character that I'd had elsewhere had simply evaporated. And it never really came back as I tried to make it in Hollywood in those early days. And I was there for three or four or five years on and off. And uh, they, were, they were a very low time because uh, I just did not eclipse with that place at all. You talk about, you know, that is a time when HIV is like the specter that shadowed lives um, everywhere. And, you know, I, I went to the U.S. in the 90s and I caught some of that as well when you didn't... Um, know what was happening as someone who's lived through that world where you don't know if the virus lurked in the body of somebody you were meeting or talking to do you reflect on that and whether there are lessons to be had from living through that kind of pandemic as we live through another kind of pandemic very different but again one where we don't know where the virus lurks you know it feels like our lives, uh, we keep having to hit the pause button on so much that we took for granted. Um, no, I don't find it, uh, I don't feel it, it has any similarities at all. Firstly, uh, mostly because, you know, everybody in this pandemic is with everybody else. Uh, in our pandemic, and I don't mean to be competitive about the pandemics, but ours was a pandemic of re rejects. Uh, people uh, avoided us. Uh, people, uh, even friends, uh, you'd go to somebody's house who had a family and you could see out of the corner of your eye that your plates were being washed separately uh, from the rest of the groups, which, you know, fine, it, it was understandable, but it was, a, it, was a, um, it was a disease that nobody wanted to talk about. Uh, it was a disease that a whole group of people thought was um, God speaking directly to humanity. Uh, and it was lethal uh, to everybody who got it. There was no half measures. Uh, this pandemic is a very different thing. And this pandemic, I think, is partly, uh, it, it, it's partly a social media pandemic because I think if we knew, really, if we had the figures of who died of pneumonia or flu every year, we'd be horrified. Uh, I'm, I'm not- I'm, 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 I'm not, or tuberculosis or malaria. All these things, if they were told, if we were told that 15,000 people died today of malaria, which they probably did, probably more, actually. Uh, it, it's the first time that this has happened. Uh, the virtual world and the social media world has, uh, and I'm, I'm not, by the way, trying to, uh, to, to minimalize uh, the pandemic we're going through because it's a, it is a very real thing. But it's... Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's, um, it, I don't think it's uh, similar to HIV, which by the way, has still killed 1.7 million people last year. So uh, um, it's, um, it's a major thing. And uh, this is a major thing too, but it's something that we're all at least together in. And we have an opportunity of uh, being fraternal actually about it, which, which in a way with the HIV thing, we didn't even manage to have that with ourselves because looking at our friends with the disease was like looking into a terrible mirror about what could happen to yourself. So it was, you needed so much strength to even be a friend to somebody. Uh, uh, and, and, and we managed, but it was, um, it, this is a, 
this one feels a uh, it more bonding and binding and uh, brotherly and sisterly. What do you think the impact of that now looking back now that we have the benefit of some hindsight, what do you think was the impact of that generation that that came of age, as it were, uh, during the HIV pandemic, as opposed to people who are born now who are sort of much more confidently gay? You know, they live in a very different world where the issues are more about marriage and benefits. And you, you in your book, talk about also being, being there at the sort of tail end of the time when it was still sort of illegal and shadowy and, um, you know, and, and the effect. And, and paradoxically, you say that had the effect of kind of breaking down some of the more rigid class barriers in a place like Britain. Well, I think certainly uh, when I first came out onto uh, a gay scene in England, it was an amazingly ageless and classless uh, event. There were only two or three places in London to go to. And uh, you kind of counted just for having the nerve to go to them still. Uh, when I, I didn't realize this either uh, when I was a kid, but we'd only been legal for, I think, seven years when I first came to London. So, uh, and even though we were legal, in a typically kind of um, hypocritical British way, we were legal uh, to express ourselves in privacy. We were not legal to express ourselves in a public place. So that gave the police all the leeway they wanted. If they saw us holding hands, they could arrest us, they could do, so things didn't really get that much better. But it, uh, so getting to a gay club, you, you just kind of counted for, for having the nerve to go in. And once you got inside, you saw this extraordinary cross-section of society and uh, our incredibly rigid class system uh, in, in England was completely broken down uh, uh, by sex and sexuality and by a feeling of outsiderness. And uh, it was very exciting. Um, and it was rough and ready. It was, uh, it, was, uh, it was outside, it was against walls and it was in parks because you couldn't go on toilets and things like this, things that the, the youth today think is absolutely revolting actually. But it was because that's how it had to be. And, uh, and what's amazing about the world is when things have to be like that, then somehow you make it into a glamorous event. Uh, and I think it, people love that world. Uh, they loved uh, the illegality of it. They loved being in a secret uh, society only recognizable, you know, uh, by kind of looking someone in the eye, for example. Uh, and, um, and uh, of course, that generation were the one that really uh, pushed for the things that this genera these generations now have. Uh, what's funny, ironic, is that there's, there, the two groups aren't really finding a middle ground to communicate on. You know, the younger generations, I don't know whether it's the same in India, but in England, I just read a script that I was offered a part in and uh, from someone who came from the 80s. And the people in the script talking about us, oh, well, you're so selfish, so self-obsessed, you don't know about anything, you can't do anything. And that's how that generation think of our generation. And um, so, there's a, a, such a big change in this new uh, um, virtual, uh, uh, new, very puritanical culture, actually, that's coming up in, in uh, Europe and the West, compared well, to I, I know in, in, in San Francisco, in Castro, which is sort of the home of gay culture, supposedly, um, gay parents object to nude um, you know, displays in the sex shops in the Castro because they all have children now, you know, and they don't right. want to explain to children they're carrying the pram, you know, what a, what a dildo is or something right. like that. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> and when I go to the, when I went to the <laughs> gay pride parade in San Francisco, everyone in the parade was in sweatpants pushing prams with uh, twins and yeah. the heterosexuals watching the parade were the ones who'd actually had the time to dress up fabulously for it. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so, so it's, a very, it's a very peculiar, it's a very peculiar thing. And, um, and I, don't know how it's, I don't know how it will all resolve itself because uh, the, the younger generations are, are, are quite militant uh, with their Puritanism. 
uh, and uh, very judgmental of anything outside of uh, what they consider uh, morally uh, acceptable and uh, you know one false move in in our world now and and you can be cancelled literally uh, one wrong opinion so there's a feeling I think in the West that we're, we're, we're entering into a kind of almost Soviet era of conformity of the everybody you know mm. there's only one flavor of ice cream available what do you mean what flavor of ice cream do you want today is chocolate everybody yeah. must have chocolate and if you um, say something but, wrong, someone's always recording it too. But, but on the same hand, like, what is it then to play some, as you have been doing recently, play somebody like an Oscar Wilde and, uh, you know, to be thinking and be so immersed in the work and thinking of Oscar Wilde in a time of so much uh, conformity where everybody is quote unquote, as if you say, you know, trying to aspiring to a shade of beige. I think, um, well, f I, I, for me, uh, Oscar Wilde is a, is, is, is a kind of Christ figure. Um, he's, um, he was sacrificed in a way uh, so that the gay movement could begin. I mean, uh, in, in, in the modern times, uh, he was the first out gay man in that you could see him waddling down the Boulevard Saint-Germain um, because he was still famous and anybody could say that is a gay man. It was the first time that had happened, actually. Uh, and it's rather like Adam and Eve eating the apple. Once you see it, uh, mm. it's, its movement then that, becomes uh, unstoppable. And it had never been seen before because it was all secret. It was all about inverts and behind closed doors. But he was the first out man. He was outed and then he went on living. And uh, so the road to gay liberation started then. Uh, I was very much hoping that that would inspire uh, the generations today because uh, we've got to know what we come from. I think one of the things that's very bad about now is that history really has been reduced uh, in, 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 in our new virtual world so that an, an, a classic old film ends up being Scream 2, you know, not even Scream 1. Uh, so, so a sense of perspective is uh, is in one sense I think what's what's missing uh, in the world uh, now, and um, and so I think that's um, something that's really important to work at. Uh, and uh, for me, uh, it's uh, it's important whether you're a beige, um, conventional, puritanical homosexual or you're a slut from the 1970s, uh, it doesn't make any difference. They're both part of the same journey. And uh, it's great to have the perspective of how history has moved to get you to where you are. And you are all those different periods as well yourself, I think. I think we're the sum total of everything that's happened. And it's important to know history, I think. You know, when I, when I came out, I didn't even know my, my mother, and this is way before, Google and research and all of that was available and she's not even online somehow found out from somewhere and she said but you know, even Oscar Wilde was married because I was I was trying to use that oh I'm gay I can't get married and she came back at me with even Oscar Wilde was married so, I mean, he, so he funny. A, <laughs> <laughs> well I suppose you know and that that's one way of doing it if you want I mean I, I don't think it's very fair on the marriage uh, to be honest but I mean there is a side of me that thinks of all those um 18th and 19th century homosexual men happily married as well and each of them pursuing their own uh, uh, lives and agendas must have been um, must have been great in a way as well but i don't think um, it's an ideal thing for a modern person to do did you think that when you uh, you know, people, uh articles always talk about you coming out in 1989 but i don't know if that's true whether there was actually any kind of official coming out per se, but just being open about your sexuality, did you hope that other actors would follow suit? Because it wasn't just in the 19th century that people were, you know, married and leading gay lives uh, outside. Uh... Um, I didn't really think about it, to be honest. And, and you're right, I didn't really actually come out. I, I, uh, I left, I went to live in France and I got very involved in going out, actually, uh, to, to gay clubs and doing things and, in, and loving uh, the, the gay scene. And uh, at that point, you, you either have the, the, the 
opportunity to lie, uh, but in which case you shouldn't be going out. But uh, I, I thought that there was no question for me, and it wasn't really a coming out. It was just I was out, and there was no point lying about it. And I really enjoyed that side of my life more, really, than, than, than the professional side of my life, I suppose. I didn't really think about what any other young actors or actors should do. I didn't know, actually, any, any gay actors uh, from my generation uh, in England. And uh, um, and all the ones I knew in America weren't gay either. So I did I did feel kind of uh, a, a slightly isolated position in a way. Did you ever regret it professionally? I think professionally, um, it's a, these are very difficult questions because you know um, I'm sure if I was as good as Meryl Streep, uh, I could have come out and done very well. Or maybe if Meryl Streep had been a lesbian. <laughs> She, oh, she she can play a lesbian better than any lesbian can play a lesbian, but that's. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, and uh, you you, in, in show business, we spend a lot of time mulling over the past and saying, "Well, that's why that happened. That's why that happened." And and yes, you know, I think uh, uh, I could have had um, possibly possibly um, a, a better career, but then possibly not, you know. I've had to fight much harder, and I think it was good for me to fight uh, in a way. I come from a, you know, a middle class kind of ashes of empire family, and I think I deserved to fight a bit more. And uh, a lot of the other people, if I'd been straight, I would have, you know, I'd have probably, it, I would have had a, a smoother time in some, some respects. And um, I think, Again, it's going back to the failure. It, I, I think I've, I've made the most of, or not made the most of myself. I've been forced to really investigate any, any kind of different angle. You know, I had to, when things dried up for me uh, in uh, England and the US right at the beginning, I kind of, I went, I made a decision to go to Europe and try and be in Italian films and French films. I don't think I'd have needed to do that if I'd been uh, straight because I'd probably been doing something. It might not have been the top rank of films, but it would have probably been some good TV series. And I'd have ended up being just another old hetero bore on the circuit. And as it is, I, uh, I kind of did, I, I did carve my own little journey. And, uh, and I think, uh, I, so I'm, ex I'm excited about that really in the end. And, but does it feel strange to you that even now in our in the 21st century on the big screen it seems like while there are so many gay roles so to speak you know we are talking about this years after something like broke back mountain uh an openly gay person is more considered for a comic gay role as opposed to a serious gay role yes i think that's uh, that is uh, still pretty weird and um frustrating and uh I don't know what's so what it, where, where the world is quite insane is that uh, you can't really make a, trans, a film featuring a transsexual now without the transsexual community closing the film down if uh, it's not a transsexual playing the part. They don't seem to be quite so worried about uh, straight men playing gay parts. On the other hand, uh, that trans lobby. <laughs> so um, it's uh, it's it's a funny old world. Nothing makes I think nothing makes sense now, uh, but. Yes, I, I often find that frustrating. Uh, you know, uh, Sean Penn uh, gets an Oscar for playing uh, Harvey Milk and, um, uh, you know, uh, gets applauded for being brave. And, uh, you know, we don't even get, uh, we just get a chance to play uh, uh, some weird, funny character role quite often. So you're right, it's, uh, it's frustrating. Um, but... Um, Everything's changing, so who knows what will happen next. When you first got the script from My Best Friend's Wedding, were you, what was your reaction to a role like a gay best friend? I thought it was a t t total career killer, to be honest, because it wasn't even a very good role. It, was, it had like, um, I'd never really played a small part. I, because I'd moved to Europe, I'd managed to keep the kind of films I was in, at least I was playing, uh, you know, uh, lead parts. And so I can't, I, I, taking this role seemed to me like it was a, um, 
a, a real step down on the page. There was nothing much going on in the role. But then I, I um, everything changed as, uh, after I met PJ Hogan, the director, and we got on so well. And I got on. It was a, it was that really was one of those kind of uh, moments where everything there was green lights all the way for a while. So at that time, if you had a script for your Oscar Wilde film ready, um, uh, do you think that could have been the next best thing? <laughs> Yeah, no, I could have. If that's the, that's another of the things I, I I often wonder to myself why I hadn't uh, started my new writing career then because I'd have managed to do things uh, so much more effortlessly. But I think I was uh, obviously I still had things to learn and things to do, and I think um, I think the 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 trials and tribulations of of making my Oscar Wilde film when it was kind of much too late. Uh, would definitely have something to do with uh, how what probably made it good in a way. I think uh, it would have. Uh, I think um, I benefited from having to having to question everything about it because it was it was always collapsing. And uh, you know, when things collapse, you either have a choice of walking away or thinking, well, what should I do about it? And uh, and then you decide whether what you're whether you believe really in what you're doing. And so each of those times, my film collapsed. It, in, intensified at least mm. my belief in it and i think that's uh, the most important thing it was tested what do, you, a lot. What, what do you think an oscar wilde would have made of this donald trump world that we live in where there is so much that feels funny but there is but it to me it feels like it's funny without wit I don't know. I think there was a lot that was funny without wit in the 19th century, too. Sure. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, we, we're spending a lot of time now revisiting uh, the 19th century uh, in terms of, you know, ooh, that this was so bad and everything, which it was. But I think uh, that's an interesting point because I, a lot of a lot of the past was that brusque and blunt and nasty and mean and yes funny it is funny you're right in one sense it's funny because you just can't believe it but i think the whole of the past was like that people were much much nastier and crueler uh and so um i think he wouldn't have been surprised probably it's always people of, often ask uh, you know what do you think oscar wilde would think of this and that and the other i think it's a difficult question in a way because oscar wilde was absolutely of his time uh, and uh, I, I, converting him to another, uh, I don't know how it would work. Funnily enough, when the film, my film, um, was going through uh, big budget problems, and, I, and they said we can't make it, we just don't have enough money. I, I suddenly thought of making it all modern, except for Oscar Wilde, Robbie Ross, and uh, one other person in kind of nineteenth-century outfits oh. going through uh, the station to catch the Eurostar, and uh, and seeing what it would be like. Uh, seeing them uh, being looked at in a modern context or by modern people, which would have been um, quite interesting, I think. But um, he's, he's a, he really is a character of uh, the end of the Victorian era. And, you know, that, that amazing period at the beginning of the 20th century when everything was going to change. Uh, and he was in part of that nucleus, too. The, the travel writer, uh, Pico Iyer, uh, he, and, and by the way, I have to say, your travel, the parts in your book, which is about travel, whether in India or Cambodia uh, or Russia, are actually really wonderful to read, you know, Thank just you. even as travel pieces. But Pico Iyer, um, when he heard, messaged me to say when he heard that I, we were doing this conversation, he said, I want to know whether it was more fun to act across from Madonna or Julia Roberts. So this question is for Pico. Oh, well, I think Julia Roberts uh, was, is, is more fun to act uh, with. You know, she, Julia Roberts is a, uh, is a natural, uh, uh, she's, a, she's a very at home acting. Uh, and um, so when you're acting with someone who's that at home in their acting, it's very good for you too. Um, I don't think um, Madonna is so at home uh, as an actress. Uh, she's more like an actress from the 1920s or the 1930s. When you think of Marlene Dietrich, for example, who used to rehearse everything in front of a mirror, she, she's very much in control of, uh, of herself and the camera. But that doesn't necessarily include uh, the other actors in the same way as a modern actress uh, does, because the modern actress really reaches out to the other actor. The 1920s, 
30s actress is really reaching out to the camera you know uh, it's like that Gloria Swanson things the movie's got the, it. it's it's a, but, she's a silent movie star I think Madonna and what about um the what about Julie Andrews when you finally go and you're acting with her um <laughs> Did you tell her that as a child you had her pictures from Sound of Music and Mary Poppins on either side of your bed? Yes, I did. And also I told her because I, I my cross-dressing career started thanks to her too because I, after I saw Mary Poppins, I decided that I was not my parents' son, but I was Julie Andrews' daughter. And uh, I, that went on for about three or four years on and off. And I, had, uh, I, I stole the skirt at my mother's and uh, I used to go and hide in the garden, put on the skirt and be Julie Andrews' daughter. And uh, I did tell all this to, to Julie when I met her. And uh, I think initially she was quite shocked. But um, over the years, uh, we got to know each other a bit because we were, we were in uh, the Shrek films together and uh, which meant we went on tour quite a lot. And uh, she was also in um, Unconditional Love, uh, which I did with PJ Hogan. So uh, we got to see a bit more of each other. And she's an amazing, amazing woman. And she's still my heroine. Does she still, can she say, did, did you want to say, I mean, could she say spit spot like that still? Yes, she can. She's not really like that though. She's, um, She's uh, she's she's more raunchy in a funny way uh, than the spit spot self. I mean, she's she's a bit older now, uh, but um, she's uh, she's just uh, I don't know. She's an incredible person. Uh, no, she doesn't. She doesn't feel so spit spotish. She's got a will of steel. <laughs> so you know, you've done so many roles. You know, some of them have seen you know won you a lot of acclaim. Some of them, not so much. You've co-starred with an Orang Chang. Um, but is, is there a role you really, really wish more people had seen? A role you, you have a soft spot for? I think probably, yeah. My film that I made myself about Oscar Wilde, you know, I wish the whole world had seen it uh, because uh, I, I, I worked so hard on making it. And... Um, and uh, I guess my, you know, I put my whole life into it in a way. So that I would, I, I would like, I, I would, if I was king of the world, I'd insist that everybody saw it. <laughs> and um, in terms of um, when you now in the pandemic, what do you do? Do you spend a lot of time watching things like the like Crown? And and uh, what do you think of that as somebody who's, who comes a bit from that world? You're descended from Charles the Second. Is that true? I'm descended from well Charles II and uh, and James the First. Look there. Oh, there you go. Um, um, but not really. I mean, so is, so about a bit of millions of people. Uh, so I'm, I'm not. Um, I don't think I'm. A, um, I'm not a, a royal. Um, but I uh, my my tenth great grandmother was a kind of <coughs> courtesan, and she had children with Charles II. But. Um, uh, I don't watch. I do. I did watch the first series of The Crown. I um and uh, I watched. Um, what did I watch in lockdown? I watched um, Breaking Bad. Did you see that? Yes. And then uh, and then I watched a lot of documentaries. I watched. Um, so why didn't you watch the rest of The Crown? I thought you really were into the Queen and all of that. No, I'm not really into the Queen. Uh, I mean, I am into the Queen. I love. I, I like the Queen as uh, as a character. The queen for me is like, uh, she, she's yourself, she's me. Cause I, I can look at a picture of the queen in 1982 and I can remember the hat and I think, oh, I was doing that. So you can, you can always, it's like a famous person. You can, you can tie yourself and various experiences of your own uh, to someone like uh, the queen. But um, the crown, no, I did like the crown. I, I, I'm not, I'm unsure as, I, as I'm unsure of Zoom, I'm unsure of this bingey thing of watching series after series after series, 25 episodes. I don't, I, I feel there's something over entertaining about it. I'm, I, I prefer reading books now, to be honest, and uh, reading history and just looking. Uh, and uh, I, I don't like watching the news so much. And, uh, uh, and um, I, I don't know about series. I watched um, Succession uh, the other day, but I find the whole, addictive side of it is slightly depressing 
Well, we're ending, we were out of time and uh, reading books is a perfect way to end something talking about uh, literature and all of that. But since you had a Catholic, you know, you went Catholic upbringing, um, in your book you said, I wanted to be a saint with my own basilica. Mm. Rupert Everett, what would you be the patron saint of? <laughs> I would be the patron saint of um, God. I would be the patron saint of... These questions are so difficult because you want to have a very witty, clever answer. <laughs> An uh, Oscar uh, Wilde answer. <laughs> an Oscar Wilde answer. Um, I would like to... Um, I'm, I'm flummoxed. I don't know what I'd be the patron saint of. Um, I, no, I, I think I was above sainthood. I wanted to be the virgin. Oh, virginity. The patron saint of virginity. Rediscover. Many of us have rediscovered this in our lockdown time. We have rediscovered our virginity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, pray for me then. <laughs> Thank you, Rupert Everett. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, the patron saint of virginity. Perhaps the patron saint of good Scottish botanist gin could also uh, feature. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's possible too. Yeah, but I, prefer, I think virginity is good. I'm going to go with that one. Okay, uh, uh, we leave that to you. It's your choice uh, after a long time. But thank you both. That was absolutely stunning. Thank you, Rupert Everett. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. A brilliant. Thank you. I hope I hope it's not too too hot for you all over there. It, it isn't yet, but um, uh, hopefully with the monsoons coming, being around, we'll sort of we won't drown. Some parts of the country we're drowning, uh, but the rest of it is sort of dry. The rest of us will drown in our own sweat. That's right. Yeah. But just to thank our audiences for watching, and I hope, do hope you log back at 8.30 p.m. for our next session, California Dreaming, Reimaging Silicon Valley, David C. Brock in conversation with Arun Mohan Sukumar. And that's at 8.30 p.m. See you then.